Welcome to Beyond By Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bikes. In today's episode, we will be talking about DSO transitions. Within the studio, there's me, Ash, and Robert. Good afternoon. And to talk more about the subject matter, we have a very special guest. His name is Brandon Moncrief. He's the principal and CEO of McLaren & Associates. Now, Brandon has over two decades of experience in the dental industry. He's been a banker and a sell-side advisor and has been involved in the sale of over 1,000 dental practices. His firm, McLaren & Associates, is the industry leader in providing sell-side advisory to dental practice owners including all specialties, an emerging DSO seeking a DSO affiliation or private equity partner. So how are we doing today, Brandon? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So Brandon, to start it off, let me ask you this question. You know, you've always been, like you said, the, the broker and the sales side advisor, but how did you get into the DSO industry or market and, and start focusing on working with sellers to DSOs? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I've got a finance and banking background. Uh, I spent about a decade as a Dell lender. And then we were on the, you know, when I bought McLaren about 12 years ago, we spent about the first seven years focused on doctor to doctor transactions, right? Selling uh, a practice to another dentist. That's really how the company was formed and, and built over the course of about 27, 28 years, you know, that was what we did day in, day out, helping individual practice owners sell to another individual. But about five years ago, we noticed private equity and DSOs begin to consolidate the marketplace very, very quickly. And being in Texas, which is where our company is based, we were really on the forefront of consolidation. Texas is the home of quite a few DSOs. That's where their HQ lives. And they were very aggressive in this marketplace before they started to expand into you know, the Western U.S., the Midwest, and the East Coast. So as a result, we saw a lot of our premier potential clients decide rather than selling to a private buyer to sell to a DSO. And back then, five, seven years ago, there were very few options, Perlin being probably the largest one. And as we begin to call these doctors and do what we'll call exit interviews, right? They sold to a DSO without our involvement on their own. We quickly realized that Dennis didn't understand the importance of creating optionality, visiting with multiple buyers and receiving multiple offers. And they didn't understand how private equity, how DSOs view value. You know, from a doctor to doctor perspective, value is derived more as a benchmark, 60 to 80, maybe 90% of annual revenue or two times net cash flow. The DSO private equity world looks at valuation from a completely different viewpoint. They really look at valuation through the lens of EBITDA and applying a multiple of EBITDA to arrive at value. As a result, when we talk about larger practices, they can trade for two to three times in the DSO world what they would trade for in the private buyer world. So as we were talking to these doctors that had decided to go down the DSO road on their own, we discovered, one, they left a tremendous amount of value on the table, right? They weren't educated about how private equity looks at valuations. They right. weren't educated about how important it was to create optionality and look at different types of DSOs and different types of deal structures. And at that point in time, we realized that, hey, we can fight the good fight and try to keep private practice private and only sell practices to private buyers. But the reality is once private equity comes into an industry, they're going to pour more and more money and resources into it and it's not going away. 
So at that point, we decided to build out a team, build out a process to represent large practice owners who want to go down the DSO private equity route and ensure that they create optionality, they create competition for their practice, they're educated about their options and leverage that competitive environment to maximize their financial outcome. You know, and it's been an educational process. I think even two years ago, I kept getting the question probably every week from at least two or three clients, what is EBITDA? You know, what is that? How do you define that? And now probably everybody has to know what that is, right? I mean, it's been ingrained in everybody for, you know, the last two years. And I doubt if there's very many clients that we have and probably very many dentists that are out there that haven't had at least a phone call from at least one DSO soliciting you know, their practice. So, you know, considering that going forward that that's still happening, what should they do? Because too often what I see is they say, oh yeah, I'm interested because of the money you're offering. And they don't say that. They say, yes, I'm interested and give me an offer. And then they just, they're stuck. They go down that road. They can't see any other options. So what should they do when they get that phone call? Yeah, I think the biggest mistake that dentists make when they look at selling their practice to a DSO is responding to an unsolicited offer, right? DSOs are designed to try to create what they call proprietary leads. Uh, essentially, they fill big marketing machines, business development teams to knock doors and you know, send solicitations to practices with the hope that the owner is going to pick up the phone, call them enter into what they think is a casual conversation that quickly turns into a formal conversation about selling their business. They're not educated. They don't have proper representation. And while the offer might look sexy on the surface, you know, there are a lot of strings attached to these transactions. And oftentimes, just because an offer looks sexy economically comparative to selling to a private buyer, you don't know how good that offer could be unless you have proper representation and you shop the practice to multiple DSOs. So, I mean, the first step is to call somebody like us and have a discovery call, right? Talk about, you know, first of all, what's your why? Why are you considering pursuing a DSO affiliation or private equity partner? What are your goals? Is it solely economic? Are you looking for administrative support? Have you tapped out your banking relationships and you need additional capital to fuel continued growth? There are many reasons why a dentist may consider or specialist may consider going down the DSO path, but you clearly got to define that why. We spend a lot of time with our clients getting to know them from that perspective. And then we quantify economics. All right, let's do evaluation. Let's do an EBIT analysis. If we took the practice to the open market, what do we believe it would trade for? And Robert, you touched on it. You know, everybody should know what EBITDA is, right? EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. Essentially, it's absentee owner profit. If you pay all the true overhead of the business and you pay the doctor to do the dentistry, how much money is left over for the absentee owner slash investor? And it should be a pretty objective conversation, right? If you give your numbers to five CPAs, five DSOs, you give your numbers to me, everybody would should come back with, the same EBITDA calculation. No, you're, you're going to get six different numbers. <laughs> absolutely. However many people you give your numbers to, that's how many answers you're right. going to get. Yep. And DSOs tend to play a lot of games with EBITDA. So they may dangle a carrot and say, hey, doc, we're going to give you a great multiple on your EBITDA. We're going to give you a seven or eight times figure on your EBITDA. And that sounds attractive, right? That sounds at top of market. But the reality is they play games in the EBITDA calculation to drive down your EBITDA. So if they're putting quarters and not giving you credit for personal expenses, ad backs, discretionary, non-recurring expenses, and they're layering in sometimes some of their own infrastructural costs, the EBITDA number they give you is going to be artificially low. So they might give you seven or eight times an artificially low number, whereas if we had done the EBITDA analysis and controlled the narrative, the EBITDA could have been a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars higher, and we could have gotten potentially that same multiple, three hundred thousand dollars times the seven multiple is two point one million in value. So oftentimes we're able to move the needle 
significantly, sometimes with larger practices, as much as several million dollars in value simply by controlling the narrative regarding evidence. When I think even on a small practice, you know, let's do the math, show that to the listeners, basically, you know, if you can increase EBITDA by, let's say, $50,000, what's that worth to them as a sale price? Yeah, so let's just take like a, you know, $2 million revenue practice with uh, a 25% EBITDA margin. So it's got $500,000 in EBITDA and it's going to trade for, let's call it seven times EBITDA. Just a $50,000 delta in EBITDA is equivalent to $350,000 in value. Yeah, that's amazing. Imagine, you know, let's say you like remodeled your office or bought an expensive piece of equipment and wrote it off and the DSO didn't give you credit for that non-recurring expense. It could cost you $350,000. And when you layer in multiple ad backs of that nature, it, it could go up into the millions. And it's in the DSO's best interest not to look too hard to uncover some of those ad backs, right? It's in their best interest to pay as little as they can for your practice. Absolutely. Yep. The easiest way to do that is to manipulate EBITDA and, and not be in a competitive environment. And look, I don't blame them, right? If I was a private equity investor or if I had money invested with the private equity firm that backs that DSO, you know, that the name of the game is to buy low, sell high. So I would do the same thing if I was in their shoes, but I'm not. We sit on the sell side. We represent dentists. Our job is to ensure that you get every dollar that you deserve. Well, and then why you? Why McLaren? I mean, how did you become an expert? And, and are there other people out there like you? There are a handful of other people that do sell side representation for doctors that are looking to go down the DSO private equity route. What makes us different is, is several factors. One, you know, our experience and reputation. Our firm's been around 35 years. I've got over 20 years of experience. We have multiple other people on our team that have over a decade of experience. We're very buttoned up from a process standpoint. We really understand the numbers. Most of our team is CPAs and, you know, former bankers. So we really look at this far from a, a numbers perspective, and that's key in controlling that narrative regarding EBITDA and maximizing value. We have an impeccable reputation. I don't think you'll find any other sell side advisor or broker with a hundred five star reviews from real clients on Google. So when it comes to experience, process, team, uh, I don't think anybody can touch us uh, for, from that standpoint. And then what's the difference, you know, when, when these DSOs do come calling to some of the, the listeners, you know, what's the difference if they get a phone call from, I won't name any names, but they may get, you know, a phone call from one DSO as opposed to another one. How do they know without talking to someone like you, which one of those is better if they start throwing out numbers like, you know, seven, seven and a half times EBITDA, you know, so should they just, you know, tell them, oh, write the check, I'll sell to you. Or should they still consult with an expert like yourself? And, and what, what differentiates the DSOs from each other? So 90% of our clients are already in conversations with the DSO or one or more and already have one or more offers on the table at the time they engage us. Um, I say this all the time. If you've met one DSO, you've met one DSO. They're all different in, in a multifaceted uh, perspective. So each DSO has a different deal structure that they utilize, right? Some of them buy 100% of your practice and you know, there's going to be some type of holdback component. Some of them are going to utilize a joint venture structure where they're going to buy a portion of your practice and you're going to retain equity at the practice level. Others are a holding company model where they're going to buy all your practice, but you're going to roll equity into holding company stock. So structurally, they're all different. It all have their own nuances. They're also all different from a historical perspective. You know, what's their story? What's their size? Who's their private equity backer? You know, how heavy handed are they from a operational perspective and management perspective? Do they have robust infrastructure and they're really going to help alleviate that administrative burden or the infrastructure light? You know, they don't really have a headquarters or uh, operational infrastructure and it's really going to be sort of hands-off and more of an economic play for you. So there are so many 
factors that should go into the decision-making process for the doctor as to who they sell, one, why they're selling and who they sell to, that they absolutely have the data around, right? They need to shop the practice. They need to get perspective on the multitude of options available in the marketplace and understand the landscape before they decide what DSO, what deal structure is the right fit for their practice. And I would argue that deal structure and fit from a cultural and operational perspective matter as much or more than the valuation. I see. Okay. Now I actually have a question about this. So what if they go in contrast where the deal structure sounds good, but the fit isn't just right? So fit is critically important because normally when you talk about why, mm -hmm. right? And we always start there. Why are you looking to sell? A lot of our large practice owners and more and more so younger practice owners are selling because they've built this big business. Now the business is kind of running them rather than them running the business. They want to buy back some of their time, have a little bit better work-life balance. They need help from an administrative perspective. And if the DSO does not have operational infrastructure and can't really support them from an administrative perspective and their why, their, their primary reason for doing something is because they want and need support, you could end up giving up a significant equity component of your business without getting what you're looking for in return. So fit really, really matters when you're talking about looking for operational support. And if you're younger, the longer your runway, right? The longer you're going to be there working at that practice post affiliation, the more critical fit is. I mean, some doctors might be able to get through, you know, two or three years of working for a DSO that they don't love, but a 45 year old that has no plans to relocate or retire anytime soon, doesn't want to be tethered to a DSO that they don't like, you know, for five, 10, 15 years, right? Right. So making sure your post-affiliation happiness is, is at a high is critically important, regardless of how good the economics were on the front end. If you're miserable and tethered to that office long-term post-sale, you're going to regret selling. You're going to have seller's remorse. You know, and one of the big uh, concerns that I hear all the time from clients about a DSO coming to, to um, uh, possibly buy their practice is, uh, you know, I don't want to be told how to practice dentistry. They're all concerned that they're going to lose control. I guess dentists are, to some degree, they're control freaks, or at least they want, you know, some say some over are. how they practice, how they treat the patients, and they're afraid they're going to lose that. And sometimes they're afraid they're going to lose that to a non-dentist, you know, to a corporate type. So how would you respond to that? These traded actions, when you're looking at a, a DSO affiliation, are a balance between economics, deal structure, fit, support, and what you just touched on, autonomy. So DSOs of today, the DSOs that we work with, they're not all like this, and we don't work with every DSO. There's over 300 DSOs out there. We work regularly with about 50 to 60. Uh, and those vary depending on, you know, region, geography. Um, what doctors need to think about is some DSOs are more heavy handed from an operational autonomy and from a, uh, a, a daily management uh, of the office standpoint, while others are very hands off. Right. So you have, those are the spectrum. The spectrum's like the huge DSO that has a really heavy, heavy hand from a managerial operational perspective. And, and maybe it's going to have some say so clinically versus those that are completely hands off operationally and clinically. The DSOs that we work with on a regular basis allow for pure clinical autonomy. They are not going to get involved in chair side decision making, treatment planning, supplies, or lab. They may help leverage economies of scale to buy the supplies that you want to use at a lower cost or to use the labs that you want to use at, you know, a lower cost, but they are not going to dictate, uh, how you do dentistry from an operational perspective. It's going to vary depending on who the DSO is and 
how heavy handed they are from a managerial perspective. From clinically speaking, you're protected from an autonomy standpoint. From an operational perspective, it's going to depend on who you sell to as to how involved they are in the daily, you know, operations of the business. And I think that's also where someone like you would come in. I mean, how would one evaluate that, that, you know, uh, the DSO I'm going to sign on with is going to give me that autonomy clinically? We do an inordinate amount of vetting uh, on the buyers that we will allow to sit at the table with our sellers. Um, so first and foremost, it comes down to defining that why, right? Why is the doctor selling? What are they looking for? That's going to determine to some degree fit who we take the practice to, who we shop the practice to, and allow the opportunity to meet the doctor and bid on the opportunity. So yeah, we, we spend an insane amount of time vetting these DSOs, learning about how they function from an operational perspective, what type of infrastructure they have, how they're involved in the offices on a daily basis, talking to the doctors under their umbrella to see what their experience has been like before we ever allow them to sit down with one of our doctors. And then as our doctors begin to move through the process, diligence is designed to be a two-way street, mm -hmm. right? The DSOs are going to ask a million questions. They're going to want all the data on the seller's practice. They're going to want to get to know the seller. We believe that it's equally important for sellers to ask a lot of questions of the buyer, right? So we give all of our clients a list of discussion topics and questions to ask during the initial interaction with the DSOs that we put at the table. As we get closer to making a decision and narrowing the field to the top, let's say two or three buyers that our client is most interested in partnering with, We'll get a list of doctor references and make sure that our client speaks with doctors that have been affiliated with that DSO for some time to hear about, you know, how did the transition go? How has it been post affiliation? What does life look like on a daily basis partnered with this particular DSO? So they can get real world guidance on from somebody that's, that's been through it at, with that particular DSO and is living with them as a partner daily. No, that's fantastic. Getting real life testimonials instead of just going on the website to that bottom section. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Think, yeah absolutely. I mean, look, when DSOs are courting you, you know, they're going to say all the right things, right? right. They're all going to, they're all going to promise you the moon. Nobody's going to tell you where their blind spots are or where their deficiencies are. It's our job through constantly attending all the different DSO events we attend, doing transactions and following up with our, our clients post-sale to get that feedback and ensure that, you know, we're only putting the best of the best at the table to begin with when we take an opportunity to work it. When the DSOs come in and, and talk to a client and they, they, when you're not involved yet, don't they try to get the client to sign a, um, uh, an exclusive agreement so they can't take it to, you know, like six other DSOs. So how do you get around that? Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, don't sign an offer. Don't sign any type of NDA that includes an exclusivity provision. Certainly don't sign an offer until you've had the opportunity to speak with somebody like us. Because all letters of intent include an exclusivity provision that precludes the doctor from speaking with any other buyers for a, a finite period of time. You have typically anywhere from 90, sometimes all the way up to 180 days. So if you sign that offer prematurely, then you've lost leverage to create competition and optionality. So you do not want to sign any type of legally you know, binding agreement. And by the way, LOIs are not legally binding with the exception of the exclusivity provision within the LOI. Oh, that's very so interesting. It's not legally binding at all for the DSO, but it's legally binding for you in the sense that you can't talk to anybody else. You know, that's, that's interesting usually, because they usually say that. You know, this is non-binding, but right. it is binding yeah, with respect to the exclus exclusivity agreement. Interesting. Exactly. Very good. Most, LO most LOIs say they're non-binding and then except for provision, you know, 10A, which is the exclusivity provision. But there's all these little, you know, tricks of the trade that private equity and DSOs utilize to limit your optionality. 
That's great information. Great. What else would you tell somebody that they, I mean, what's, what, what are the, the, the hot points that people need to know that people need to be concerned about other than just pick up the phone and call you? I think one of the things I'd like to touch on is with well, a couple of things you need to vet points for that why and make sure that pursuing a DSO affiliation in the first place is the right fit for where you're at with, with your practice, with your career, you need to quantify, you know, what is your practice? How is it engineered economically? Is now the right time for you to pursue a sale? What does your runway look like to exit? Define what you're trying to accomplish. Quantify the economic outcome before you ever get serious about sitting down with a buyer and negotiating a deal. I think the, the other than responding to unsolicited offers, one of the biggest mistakes that dentists make is pursuing a sale prematurely or going down the DSO path when maybe that's not the best fit for their situation. It's, it's easy to get uh, FOMO or, or, or get, you know, lured into doing a transaction with a DSO that's maybe not the right fit or going down that path. Maybe it wasn't the right path for you to go down. So making sure that you're pragmatic and making the decision to go down the DSO road to begin with, I think is critically important. And then if you do, just ensuring that you create an environment where you've got the leverage to, to negotiate and find the right fit and maximize your outcome. You like know, those are the keys you know, to, I to think that, this process right. And I think that fear of missing out is a big issue because a lot of the clients that I talk to, you know, are afraid that this offer won't be around in three years. I'm going to do it now because I don't want it to go away. They're afraid that the DSO market's going to crash in three to five years. And, you know, they're, they're, they're afraid they can't get that kind of money for their practice 10 years from now. How would you respond to that? Where do you think the future of the DSO market's headed? So we, we would have thought that with interest rates going up and, you know, bank leverage tightening up, that valuations would come down. And we, that has not been the case. There's been a lot of predatory marketing, a fear-based marketing out there by both DSOs and yes. other brokers. Yes. You know, sell now or, you know, wait five years or, you know, the bubble is going to pop or dentistry is going to get so consolidated, your practice is going to be worthless. I hate that, that, that type of messaging and marketing. Fear or panic is never a good reason to, to make uh, a monumental decision with your business. So we don't expect the market to slow down. All right. We think the next five to seven years, valuations are going to be steady and strong. And that's what we've seen, you know, in the marketplace. Coming out of COVID, valuations increased significantly. You know, practices that were trading for four to five times EBITDA pre-COVID are now trading for six to seven times EBITDA. Those valuations on really, really strong practices with, let's say, revenue in the two to 10 million range have increased even further over the past six to nine months. So we have not seen the marketplace slow down at all. I mean, nobody's got, you know, a crystal ball. Nobody can predict the future with 100% accuracy. I don't think anybody should make a decision based on, you know, FOMO, fear, or pain. I agree. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, that was some great information there, Brandon. Well, I think, no, it's great advice. I hope people take it to heart and, uh, you know, really, um, Give it a try. And if they do that, you know, how would they get a hold of you? Yeah, a couple ways to get a hold of me. I'll give you my cell phone number. You can call, text 512-660-8505. My email is Brandon, B-R-A-N-N-O-N at dentaltransitions.com. And we have a tab on our website, a DSO transaction resource tab got a lot of podcasts and articles where we do a little bit, you know, deeper dive into some of these topics, in particular DSO deal structures. So that's dentaltransitions.com, that DSO transactions resource tab. It's a great place to go to just learn more about this ecosystem. Oh, that's great. Great platforms for our listeners to go to and get more informed. Absolutely. 
We appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us today, and I look forward to probably a follow-up call sometime down, down the road in the future, short future. Absolutely, guys. Stay in touch. Thanks, Thanks Brandon. Brandon. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond by Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more information, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.